you've got a Bible, I want you to grab it and turn to the book of Colossians. Colossians chapter 2 is, uh, is where we'll be in just a moment. Uh, we are walking through Colossians as a church, and uh, we'll actually finish this uh, Sunday. We've, we've done this in four weeks, and so literally you can imagine there are four chapters, as you know, in the book of Colossians, and so we have covered this chapter by chapter by chapter. And if you're familiar with the book of Colossians, you could probably agree with me of doing a chapter a week does not give due justice to the chapter that you're preaching. And yet I think the thing that's been helpful is it really gives our people, as we preach through this, a picture of the full thought of the chapter. And so we've had to, to rush through things and then park and go deep on things, but it's been a, a journey that, uh, that has been meaningful to our church. And I, and I really felt like the Lord was going to push me towards Colossians chapter 1 with you today, but, but for whatever reason, I really feel uh, led by the Spirit to talk about uh, Colossians chapter 2. And I do want to give you, in some ways, the, the full picture of the chapter, uh, of how it begins and how it ends, and then we're going to talk about the middle uh, this morning. He begins by talking about his prayer uh, for those in Colossae and all those in Laodicea, uh, and his, his main heartbeat is that they would have a full assurance of who Christ is, the mystery of God. And he goes into this perspective and he's talking through this. And then he comes to really what I believe is an important thing. He says this in verse 4, if you look at it with me. He says, I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. In other words, I pray that no one will mislead you with arguments. What's he worried about? What is he concerned about? In my opinion, he is concerned about something that sounds right, that looks right, that seems familiar, that... It seems almost there, and yet it's not there at all, and it's against the gospel of Jesus. And what he's concerned about is actually legalism. That's the heartbeat of verses 16 through 22. If you'll point your eyes down there, he's, he's saying, listen, don't let them cast judgment on you. Don't let somebody disqualify you for these traditions of men are, are, are things that Jesus would one day come to fulfill. They're just a shadow. And he says in verse 23, the last part of the chapter here, he says, these have indeed an appearance. If you've got your Bible, I would underline the word appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body. A powerful phrase he says here, but they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. And so if he is worried that we are going to be misled, that the church will be misled by something that seems so right, and so familiar and yet completely wrong, this thing being legalism, like I said, that has no bearing on stopping the indulgence of the flesh, then I think the question for all of us today is this, well, how do we overcome legalism? And I realize that I'm speaking to some who are not pastors and will never be pastors, and then I'm speaking to many of you who are pastors and will be pastors in the room, and I think the passage actually applies to both. And so how do we overcome legalism? I really believe the answer might be different than you think. The title of my message today is just Jesus is greater than legalism. Jesus is greater than legalism. And I thought as we began today that I would give you my understanding and just a definition of legalism. And here's the way that I wrote it for you. Legalism is depending on anything other than Jesus to make you righteous. Legalism is depending on anything other than Jesus to make you righteous. Now, I got to be honest, I, uh, I understand that, that when I begin to speak about legalism, I realize that you may say, well, gosh, this would have been a great day to skip chapel. Now, this is not something I, I struggle with. In fact, th where I'm pastoring, this is what I try to break my people out of, that, that your traditions and your preferences are, are faulty assurances of holiness and, and righteousness before God. And so, man, this, this probably wouldn't have been a good day since I got a test later just to skip chapel. And uh, this, is, this is not something that I deal with. And I would just, I would just tell you to pause. And I'd, I'd probably just say to you this way, not so fast, my friend. Uh, pastors are functional legalists. You may say, well, certainly, certainly not me. I, that, that's not me. Um, you don't think you struggle with legalism? Here's a good way to tell if you struggle with legalism. Uh, you wait until you've battled sin the week before you're supposed to stand up and preach. And ask yourself if you don't fight legalism. You wait until you're having doubt as a pastor, and yet you have to get on the stage on Sunday. Wait until you're wrestling with God over something happening in your life, over something, some, some circumstance in your family that you do not want to be there, and then you have to get up on stage and act like everything's fine on Sunday, and you have to preach the Word of God. You wait until you get a sense of, of your severe and extreme unworthiness to stand in the pulpit. Then you'll understand if you struggle with legalism. 
You see, legalism is represented in all of those thoughts because it is a thought that I can live in such a way that would actually justify me being in the pulpit. And I want to remind us, obviously the New Testament speaks towards the character of a pastor, towards the actions and the holiness of a pastor, and so I'm not discounting that at all. But I think it's a, it's a good foundation, a good place for us to begin with, is that I think it's a good reminder that the only reason why you or why I can today stand in a pulpit and preach the words of God to a group of people is because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross for us. Nothing else is sufficient. I, I can behave good as a pastor. It's not enough. I can try to try to live good as a husband and as a father. It's not good enough. All of us are only qualified to preach because of what Christ has done in us. And so I want us to begin in verse 6, and uh, this is really where he gets into kind of where he's going for the... Uh, uh, for this this uh, fight against legalism in their lives. And so let's just reading, uh, read beginning in verse 6. He says, therefore, so, so therefore because I want you to come to a full knowledge of Christ and because I, I don't want you to be misled by, by plausible arguments, he says, therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. In other words, Paul is saying that the first way that you get over legalism is you begin to go back to the way it was when you first came to Christ. In the same way that you received Christ Jesus the Lord, now you walk in that same manner. And so the way that I defined this to our church a few weeks ago and and the way that I would define it to you, I think there are several ways that we define conversion. We may talk about it being a surrender. We may talk about it being repentance. We may talk about it being faith. And, and I believe all of those are, are biblically correct. But, but here's the three things that I gave our church, okay? When we receive Christ, we come with childlike faith. Childlike faith. Interestingly, in the New Testament, well, children are never told to be like adults in their faith, but adults are told to be like children in their faith. That's just something for good, just for us to stop and think about today. So we come in childlike faith. I believe we come in complete repentance. You think about when uh, that moment you came to faith in Christ, uh, there is, there's no justification of your sin in that moment. You remember the brokenness you experienced then? There, there's, no, uh, there's no excuses for sin. It's just complete repentance. And that's what our people, it's just total surrender. Total surrender. I sat with a college student yesterday uh, who came into my office in between services and uh, he said, hey, do you have a few minutes this past Sunday, and so I said, yeah, and he began to talk to me about how he realized he wasn't a Christian, and, and I could tell he was close, and so I said, why don't you think about it the next couple of days, and then let's, I'll text you, and let's, let's meet up. So we met up yesterday morning before I drove to Kansas City, and uh, this guy's name was Jacob, and, uh, and I said, well, why do you want to give your life to Christ? And think about his language here. He said, I, I know I need to change. I know I need to change. And I said, you know what part of salvation is when you, when you surrender your life to Christ. It is like waving a white flag that, that I know I need to change, but I cannot change. And praise be to God, Jacob surrendered his life to Christ uh, yesterday, right before I came up here. In the next few verses, he goes back to this idea of not wanting them to be misled. Look at verse 8. He says, see to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition." according to the elemental spirits of the world and not according to Christ. Literally, when you, when you see the words uh, take you captive, it's, it's the thought of robbery. So he's saying, let no one rob your faith here. He uses the word philosophy here. This is the only time this word is used in the New Testament. And uh, it's not speaking about all philosophy, but he's speaking against a false philosophy. I think we all agree in Christian philosophy, things that can help us understand the faith, defend the faith. But here he speaks about a false philosophy and he describes it like this. It is, it is empty and it is deceitful. In other words, this, this philosophy is vain. It is, it is hollow. He goes on in verse 9 and he says this about Jesus. He says, For in Him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in Him who is the head of all rule and authority. This is uh, reemphasizing what he's already talked about in that beautiful passage in Colossians chapter 1, that Jesus is God, the perfect imprint of the Father here. Starting in verse 11 is, is really where I want us to, to just park for the rest of our time today. 
And I really believe that when we think about, so how do I get out of legalism as a follower of Christ or even as a pastor thinking that anything other than Jesus makes me right with God? I believe these next few verses are the answer. And so I want to I kind of sum up the verses and then we're going to walk through them. It is that Paul is about to remind these Colossian believers about their conversion experience. Which I think a logical question for us is this. Well, why is Paul talking to a bunch of Christians about when they got saved? I mean, why would he do that? It's not like, like this letter was written to uh, these people in Colossae that they were supposed to, to rally all their lost friends together and then read the letter from Paul, and it was like an evangelistic crusade. That, that would have been cool. That just wasn't the purpose here. And so he's writing this to the church, writing this to believers. And so why in the world is he reminding these believers about their salvation? I think it's simply this. Paul realized that the only way for you and I to truly overcome legalism is to consistently remind ourselves what Jesus Christ has done for us on the cross and that that is the only thing that can really make us righteous. And so I believe he gives us four pictures of salvation here in the next few verses. You could probably say there's five, but I'm just going to focus on four today. And so I want to just walk through these, these different pictures on salvation and what Christ did in you the moment that you were saved. Number one picture he gives us is a picture of circumcision. The picture of circumcision. Look at verse 11. He says, in him, so in Christ also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. That's a key phrase there. Underline that phrase. He says, by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Now, again, if, uh, surely you are familiar with the New Testament, and if, if not, you're probably wondering, well, why in the world is he talking about circumcision here when he begins to talk about how they received Christ? And I think it's a, it's a beautiful picture, actually. Uh, he is writing to Gentile believers in Colossae, so non-Jews in Colossae, uh, who had no need to follow the circumcision laws of the Jewish nation. If you can remind yourself the Old Testament about the purpose of circumcision, it was an outward sign of, of a need of inward change. And so just remind, remember that for a moment as we go back to that here in a second. And so without uh, going where none of us want to go today, let me just remind you, circumcision is a process that, that most infant boys go through. And it is a cutting away of unnecessary skin. It is a cutting away of skin. Uh, Paul is speaking about how these these Gentile believers need to refuse a physical circumcision because they have already undergone a spiritual circumcision. That's where that phrase, made without hands, that Jesus has done a circumcision of the heart. And I love the way that, that this is in the original language, this, this phrase, putting off the body. It's a word here that is used, again, only one time in the New Testament, and, and it indicates a total breaking away from something. So think about the picture of salvation. It's a beautiful picture. That when you come to Christ, Christ circumcises your heart. It's a circumcision made without hands. And it is a total breaking away from who you used to be. But let me just remind us in the room today. I'm going to say this statement again and again and again today. You are not who you used to be. Anybody grateful for that this morning? We have had a circumcision made without hands. A circumcision of the heart. And that's the first picture that Paul gives us here of salvation. He moves on to the next thing. He gives us a picture of being buried and being raised. Of being buried and being raised. Look back at verse 12. He says, Having been buried with Him in baptism, in which you were also raised with Him, through faith in the powerful working of God, who raised Him from the dead. And, and so in a similar vein, yet different, he says just as a circumcision was an outward sign of the need for an inward change, now baptism is an outward sign of a change that has already taken place in the life of a person. This passage is not saying that salvation, or excuse me, that, that baptism saves you, but is consistent with the rest of the New Testament that it is a picture and it is a picture that your life has been buried with Christ and now you've been raised back to life. And so you think about all the biblical reasons why we do baptism by immersion as Baptists. And perhaps I would say there's no more beautiful picture, no more beautiful reason that we do immersion baptism than what we read about here in Colossians chapter 2. That your old life has been buried with Christ and you have been raised in a new life with Jesus. I'll just say the statement again. You are not who you used to be. 
He goes on and gives us a third picture. It's, a, it's actually a similar picture of being buried and raised. He gives us a picture of being dead and alive. Of being dead and alive. Look at verse 13. He says, and you, so, so you Christian, you follower of Christ, who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses. Now, I, I want you just as a follower of Christ, I think there's an important word to underline in your Bible. I want you to underline the word all. Aren't you thankful that Jesus Christ has forgiven all of our sins? And this happened at the moment of salvation. And so Jesus doesn't forgive us based on our behavior. Well, it, you know, you've made an initial decision to follow me, and so I'll give you a little bit of forgiveness. And then, then the more you follow me, then I give you a little bit more, and then a little bit more. Uh, that, that's, that's called a bad marriage. There are a lot of marriages that work like that. Well, as long as you behave, then I'll forgive. And I'm so thankful Jesus doesn't operate in that way with us. If you're familiar with the book of Ephesians, Paul almost uses the same exact language in Colossians chapter 2 that he uses in Ephesians chapter 2. Think about what he says in Ephesians 2.1. He says, and you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. Ephesians 2.5, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ by grace you have been saved. I think one of the most beautiful pictures of lostness, which Sounds like a weird thing to say, but one of the most beautiful pictures of lostness in the Bible is the picture of being dead. Not even of being a sinner, not even of being an enemy of God, but, but man, you're, you're just flat out dead. All the time in ministry, I just want to give you a fair warning, you're going to deal with death all the time. In fact, as Meredith and I drove up here yesterday, I, uh, I spoke to a man on the phone in our church who uh, probably three or four months ago had a seizure, found out it was a brain tumor. Uh, had brain surgery and has, is going through rehab as we speak. Uh, he went in for scans just to check up. They have found what they believe is another malignant tumor in his brain. And he's having brain surgery today at 1 o'clock. I encourage you to pray for Bill, if you don't mind, at 1 o'clock. And I sat there and I talked with Bill as we were driving. And Bill choked up and he said, you know, I'm thankful for eternity. Dealing with the man's mortality... As you simply drive down the road is a heavy thing. I remember when I was in seminary, I, I worked at a church in, uh, in the Plano area of the, of the Metroplex of DFW. And I would drive back and forth to Southwestern getting my MDiv. And, and uh, one night, uh, we were called, my, my boss who I was under, and uh, kind of another guy who often dealt with families in, in tragic situations and dealt with uh, their funeral plans and stuff like this. We got a call to the hospital. Somebody in the church was dying. And it was an older gentleman, and, uh, and so we all rallied to this Texas hospital, and there's all kinds of family in the waiting room. And uh, at this moment, the doctor calls us back and, and basically gives the word that, listen, he's, he's dying right now if you want to be with him while he passes. And so we walk into this small hospital room. I, I would imagine there was probably 15 or 20 other people, and we're all packed in this room around this older gentleman wife sitting there next to him holding his hand and I don't know how to medically describe what was going on but there was some monitor on the computer screen that we were seeing and it was going down 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 and it was indicating he was dying 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 right before our eyes and, and my boss at the time he did something I was very surprised at he he said well uh, why don't we sing amazing grace you know you're thinking oh gosh is this like the real appropriate time to be singing and so he he begins to uh to sing Amazing Grace, and this, all the family starts joining around. And then, like a good Baptist, we, we skipped a couple of verses in the middle. We went right to the end. And I, so he said, why don't, we, why don't we sing the last one? We've been there 10,000. And, and we got to the end of that song. And as, as God is my witness, no, no pastoral exaggeration here. We got done singing that song, and that man died. It was one of the craziest stories that I have ever been involved with in ministry. I will tell this story till the day that I die. And, uh, and so, so we kind of say our goodbyes to the family, and they're still in the hospital room. And, and, and me and the two other pastors from our church walk to the elevator. And uh, elevator door closes, and the guy who worked with the funeral stuff talked to the guy who, who began the singing. And, and here's what he said in that elevator. He said, your singing just killed that guy. Yeah, and uh, it was quite the moment, right? Pretty, pretty funny uh, instance there. But here's what would happen. If we would have gone back into that room, you know what that man would have not responded to? He would have no longer responded to his wife's touch. 
He would no longer have responded to the voices that were singing. He would have not opened his eyes when somebody you know, said his name forcefully. He would have not responded. And why is that? He's dead. That is the picture that Paul gives us before we come to faith in Christ. We're just dead. We don't respond to spiritual things. That's why people come to your church and they look half bored and they sleep during the message and they have no desire for God. You know why? It's because they're dead. They spiritually cannot respond to things. Let me just say the statement again. You are not who you used to be. We once were all dead, but now we are alive. He gives us a fourth and final picture here. He gives us a picture of, uh, of canceling debt. Of canceling debt. Look at verse 14. He says that Jesus did this. He canceled the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. And this he set aside, nailing it to the cross. Verse 15 could probably give us a fifth picture, but we'll just stick with four. He said he disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Uh, Some of you relate with this picture of debt, right? You you have experienced extreme debt, whether that's school loans from college or whether that is uh, credit card debt that you just got out of control and took a trip to the beach with your friends, stuff like that. And so you you may understand extreme debt and it feels like you're carrying a burden, right? Carrying a weight. Literally, the picture here is like a certificate of debt because of our sin before God. And so if you can imagine every sin that you've ever written on a certificate or on a piece of paper, and you may say, well, that, that would at least be front and back. No, it, it'd, be pay, it'd be volumes, right? A multi-volume set of books here with all of our sin that would line up from here all the way back to Arkansas. And so if you can imagine these, you know, folded one by one by one by one by one over one another with all of the sin in your life, the picture here is this, is that Jesus put it on the cross and he just nailed it to the cross. He canceled the debt that we were under. Again, one of the most beautiful pictures of salvation and conversion anywhere that we see in the New Testament. You're not who you used to be. You used to be a person who was under extreme and heavy debt against God, and yet God changed everything in that moment. I really believe that, that what has happened here and what Paul is emphasizing, uh, emphasizing I, I believe this bleeds over into chapter 3 actually, but I believe that he is emphasizing, listen, your identity has been completely changed. Like everything about your life is different. That's why chapter 3 is all about he's bringing that behavior into alignment. Put off these sins, put on these things. And so he's saying, listen, you, you, you have a change in your identity, and yet really what he's getting after here in, in, in chapter 2 is your, your mindset is lacking behind. Like, like your thinking is lagging behind what, what Christ has really done. You have been made righteous because of the circumcision of God done in your heart. You've been, been made righteous because you've been buried and then raised, and you were dead and now you're alive, and you've had your certificate of debt nailed to the cross and canceled before you. And so everything about your life ha- has changed, and yet, yet you're still thinking about, well, i got to eat according to this way. And I've got to do this human tradition and that human tradition. And, and he's saying, listen, your, your, your thinking has got to catch up here. I heard a pastor tell, tell a, a silly story the other day, and I thought it would apply today. And it, it honestly is stupid, just a, a, a fair warning here, but I think it makes a good point in the end. Um, but, but he said, you know, there was this guy who owned a store, and the store owner uh, had a pet parrot. That'd be an interesting store to walk into, right? It was just sitting there in the cage, and, you know, parrots can talk and stuff, and I won't give you any kind of impression on that, but, but parrots can talk. And so uh, one day there was a customer who walked into this store and, uh, and, and, and looked at one of the customers, this parrot did, and he said, hey, kind of a surprising thing to have a parrot talk to you, right? He said, hey, and the customer was like, you talking, you talking to me? And that parrot looked at this, this customer and he said, you ugly. And so, so I mean, this, uh, th- this customer is like, what's up, dog? Like, what's up with that? Like, what, what are you talking about? And so he goes to the store owner and he's like, man, your parrot is back there talking trash to me. He called, said that I was ugly. And so that, that store owner walks back to the parrot and he opens uh, the, you know, the little cage and says, don't you talk. To my customers like that, just slap that parrot around a little bit, right? Do not insult my customers again. And so time went by, uh, time went by and a month or two later, the same customer came back into that store. And this, he walked by this parrot, and that parrot said, Hey, 
And the guy again said, jogging me. And that pair looked at the guy and just said, you know. You know. That's a stupid story, right? Is, uh, is that not the same approach that Satan gives us as it relates to legalism? You know. You know. You know what you're really like. You know that fight that you got into with your wife before you left for church today. You know. You know you're really not worthy. To, you know your past. You know who you are. And uh, I just say it this way about ministry. Satan will do everything he can in your life to get the focus off of Jesus and onto yourself. Like that's ministry 101. That's the Satan's attack. Get your eyes off of, off of Jesus and get them on yourself. That can happen in good ways. Of, uh, man, I'm the man. I'm the best preacher in the world. I'm the best children's director in the world. I'm, I'm the best. I'm, I'm so talented. Or the other side of this, there's, there's no way that you should ever be up there. You're not worthy to stand on a stage and open the Word of God. But there's no way. You know that passage. There's no way that, that you of all people are going to try to stand up and teach that passage today after what you've been struggling with. After that doubt you've been... You know what you're really like. And, and so let me just combat that. Um, you know, there's a reason why the Bible calls Satan the accuser. And he'll just constantly use that for you and against you. You know. And, and, and I, I want to encourage you to, to be a confessor. Okay, as Satan stands as the accuser in our life, I, I'm going to encourage you today as I close to be a confessor. And, uh, and, and here's how you respond to Satan, okay? Uh, you know what? You're right. But Jesus... Like, that's all of our stories. That's Ephesians chapter 2, by the way. But God. I'm not who I used to be. You're not who you used to be. And here, here's the way that I often think about it myself. When I'm battling legalism before I stand up and preach, here's what I tell myself. It's really not about me anyway. And so I'll close with this. I just want to give you a battle cry against legalism. This is straight from the lips of Jesus you know what our battle cry against legalism is? is? It's this. It is finished. It's accomplished. It's done. Already had the work completed. And so I don't know whether you're battling legalism in your life and some other area of your life thinking that, that something else can make you right before God, or maybe you're battling this even in ministry as a pastor, as I've described today. But, but I just want to just say something, and I've been saying this to my church the last few weeks as we kind of close the service. Of, can I just say the name of Jesus just again and again and again? Just Jesus. 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 Let, let His name bring calm to the chaos in your life today. Let His name bring your thinking into alignment with your new identity in Christ. It is finished. Let's pray together. Lord, we stand today um, recognizing that we are not good enough to be in ministry. We stand here today recognizing that really You are the only reason why any of us can stand up in any setting and, and proclaim the Word of God and we praise You that You really did pay it all. You finished all the work, and so we rest today. All of us who are followers of Christ, we take a collective sigh of relief of what You have done on our behalf. We trust You with our lives. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen.